Hi, everyone. Welcome back. Um, I hope everybody enjoyed a great lunch. It is my great honor and pleasure to introduce our TED Talk speaker, Alexis Gonzalez Black, to you today. Alexis is a 2007 ENC uh, alum, and she's joining us today to share some of her learnings from Zappos, where she now works. Prior to her work at Zappos, Alexis lived in ENC for a while at Eastern North Carolina and worked on the recruitment team for about three years after the Corps. Um, she and her husband moved to Las Vegas a couple of years ago for him to take the ED position here in Las Vegas for Teach for America. But, um, and Alexis started on a new adventure at Zappos when they moved here. But her passion for education has never dulled. She ran and won a seat on the Nevada Board of Education. And she is joining us today and she's gonna share some of her learnings over the past couple of years. Uh, Alexis has reserved about 10 minutes at the end of her talk for Q&A. So as she's talking, if there's things that you would really like to ask, go ahead and jot those down and we'll see how many questions we can get to. Thank you. Here's Alexis. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Um, so I realize that this is a really small room and I probably don't need a microphone to talk to all of you, but I'm being recorded by that lovely gentleman in the back. So um, hence the strange awkwardness with the microphone, but um, I hope you don't mind. Um, I'm excited to be here. Thanks, Mindy, for the introduction. Um, yeah, so you pretty much hit everything in my bio, which is exciting. Um, an illustrious professional career of, what, seven years? Yeah, so great. I'm really deep in. Um, and I'm really honored and excited to be here. Um, so what Mindy mentioned is that I started my career at Teach for America, so in the core, and then transitioned into a regional um, staff placement on the ENC team. I was the operations coordinator, the development coordinator, and the assistant to the executive director. You know how we like to wrap up roles here at Teach for America, so I did that for a year um, on our regional team and then transitioned to the recruitment team for two years after that as a recruitment manager. Um, and when I got the opportunity to leave Teach for America and join Zappos.com two and a half years ago, um, I was pretty scared for a lot of reasons, right? Not only was I leaving the warm embrace of my Teach for America family and this mission-driven environment, um, I was taking on the uh, leading their college recruitment efforts at Zappos, which was really exciting. Um, but what was probably most harrowing above all of those things was that I learned that my first month at Zappos, for the first four weeks of my tenure at Zappos, I would be in the call center on the phones and answering customer service calls. Yes, that's right. So I would be answering, I see some eyebrows like, yes, yeah. So four weeks of answering the 1-800 number and being like, hi, my name's Alexis. Thank you for calling Zappos. How can I make your day happy, right? Like answering the phone um, and providing service on the front lines to our customers which was like way out of my wheelhouse of things I had ever done before. Um, so I was very intimidated by that. Um, and what I learned was that every person, regardless of what position you're being hired into, goes through four weeks in the customer service center. Whether you are being hired as a senior VP or a director or an entry level customer service representative, we all spend those first four weeks together on the phones. Um, and that's because customer service is our mission. It's at the heart of what we do, and we want every single person to understand what it feels like to be on the front lines with our customers. Um, and so my goal today here with you guys to share a few lessons from that experience of what it means to give great customer service from the Zappos perspective, um, and then hopefully apply some of those lessons to your work with alums in our regions. Let me grab my clicker here. Um, so day one, I show up to Zappos and I'm introduced to my bubbly and gregarious leader of my new hire training, my one month training named Megan. And uh, right off the bat, she tells me, core value number one at Zappos is to deliver wow through service, right? And what does it mean to deliver wow? It means to surprise and delight our customers, right? They have a definition, surprise and delight, and extra points if you can actually get the person to say wow, right? So like, and that, I mean, it's so clear, right? We talk about clear metrics. It's so clear that like your time on the phones is laser focused on how can I get this person to say, wow, 
like, that was awesome. Thank you, Zappos, right? And so, um, you know, from day one, the stakes are really high, right? You've got to wow the pants off people and you have to come up with ways to really go above and beyond to surprise and delight. Um, and a couple of the uh, tricks that they shared with us, I'm gonna share with you today. So the first one, fairly obvious, is listen, listen, listen. So most people just want to be listened to, right? They want to talk, they want to know that you're there with them, that you're present, and that you're genuinely listening to them. Um, at Zappos, we have no call time limitations for our customer service representatives. Most companies have uh, what they call an average handle time that they aim for, right? Like four or less minutes, let's turn them through, let's get through this queue of customers. At Zappos, there is no call time limitations. In fact, the longest call on record, which just happened probably, I would say six months ago, was, can anybody guess how long it was? Just a guess, how many hours do you think? How many hours? Yeah, hours, yeah, to give you a hint. What do you guys think? Two and a half, Two and a half hours? Three hours? The longest call on record is over 10 hours. Yeah, yeah, okay, over 10 over 10 hours. And so like the woman, the call representative had to take like bathroom breaks in the call, right? Because it was too long. It was longer than her shift. She stayed over her eight hour shift to continue talking to this person. And when interviewed by the media, the call service representative said that, yeah, well the conversation, it started out talking about clothes and trends and styles. And then it kind of took a turn and we talked about Las Vegas and what it was like to work at Zappos in downtown Las Vegas. And it sort of curved and went around and talked about life and broadened and it ended at the end of 10 hours with the sale of one pair of Ugg boots. One pair of Ugg boots. And Ugg boots are expensive, right? I mean, anybody who's bought Ugg boots, pretty expensive. Worth 10 and a half hours on the phone? I don't know, right? That's a long time to be talking to somebody. Um, What's crazier than that is that a lot of our calls that are over one hour don't result in any sales whatsoever. When I was on the phones for those first four weeks, I was on the uh, two hour long call where a young man called in and it was his first time uh, dressing like a woman and he wanted some help picking out some nice lady things. And so I spent two hours just like walking him through what I thought would look awesome, you know, for him um, without a single sale at the end of the day, right? And um, and you know, some people might see that as a challenge, right? But it's actually an incredible opportunity to build personal and emotional connections with our customers, right? With our most loyal customers, which brings me to my second point, personal and emotional connection or PEC. Um, so uh, like any good um, sort of mission to you know, build PEC, it's also something that we measure. So they actually, when you're on the phones, um, your leads on your team will pull calls and sit down with you and on a rubric score how you did. And since PEC is one of our goals, it's something that we measure. And we measure PEC by effort, okay? So um, what that looks like is, um, did you ask the customer, how are you doing today? Um, or did you pick up on clues in the background of the call? So you hear a baby crying or you hear a dog barking and you say, oh, you have a dog? I also have a dog named Bandicoot. Let's talk about our dogs, right? And so you are graded and checked off on your ability to pick up clues and build conversation around the subject at hand, right? Of sales of something, which is pretty incredible. And so when I first saw this rubric, they handed it to us. He said, Alexis, you're going to be graded on this rubric. Just be ready. We're going to call, pull calls calls at random and we're going to sit down with you and grade you. I was like, hmm, I'm from Teach for America. Okay, I'm familiar with rubrics, right? Like I'm starting with the end in mind. Like you give me the sheet, I'm going to ace this, right? Like I feel ready for this. Um, so I sit down for my call review and we're, you know, listening to the call together and I'm nodding along and I'm like, yeah, check, check, check. You know, I'm doing a good job. Um, and at the end of the call, my reviewer looks at me and is like, you know, Alexis, really great job, like great advice, great, great uh, technical advice, you got it right, you're very solutions oriented, but you really struggled with PEC. And I'm like, me? Like, I struggled with PEC? Like, I was on the recruitment team. I did PEC for a living in 30 minute increments with people from all over the country, right? That's my jam, PEC. How could I struggle? And she's like, well, you just forgot to ask people, how are you doing today? 
And, and then I forgot again on the second call and I kept forgetting and I was terrible at it. And I'm like, what's wrong with me? I mean, my trainer had to put up a giant post-it note on my monitor that said in all caps, how are you doing today? Right? Like a very simple question. Um, and you know, you would think that would be easy, right? To ask those simple questions and to stop and pause in the hecticness of a call and ask somebody how they're doing. But what I learned is that these habits and these skills that we have quickly go to the wayside when you're under pressure or you're nervous or you feel under the gun, right? These small little signs that you care about somebody are so easily forgotten. Um, so um, I got better and I ultimately mastered the PEC game, learned how to ask how are you doing um, and not do it robotically, which is really important for me. Um, and I got better at relationship building, but it still didn't address one particular type of customer that was really colorful and awesome, which is um, customers that call in that are already angry with you. Um, so, um, Customers that call in who have already experienced a loss of service, right? Their shoes didn't show up at the right place. Um, their address was in wrong. You sent them the shirt in the wrong size, right? And what's obvious is that I didn't do that to them. Like I didn't send your shoes to the wrong place and I didn't enter your address in to, you know, I incorrectly in the uh, checkout screen. And I'm not the one who sent you your Nike shoes in a nine and a half in instead of a nine, right? But I'm on the front lines of receiving that experience, right? They call customer service representatives. And as soon as you pick up the phone, you can sense, right, like this person is not happy. And the thing that my trainer taught me that continues to ring in my head that she used to say over and over again is, you are not the Zappos police. You are not the Zappos police. You are not here to protect and defend Zappos, to let them know that it wasn't you. You're not here to educate them on like what happened and what went wrong, right? You are not the Zappos police. We are customer service representatives with a mission to provide excellent customer service and to wow our customers. So instead of jumping to sort of the defense or just fixing the problem and brushing it aside, the first thing you should do is listen, right? See point A, right? And then the second thing is offer a genuine apology. And it seems really small. That seems like a small thing to say sorry. But I challenge every single one of you to the next time that you call your cable company, you call T-Mobile, you call whatever uh, service company and you're angry because something has not happened correctly, listen very carefully about whether or not they say sorry. And I would bet that they don't. Right? I've started to keep track now that I work at Zappos and I know that's a thing that we do um, about whether or not people say sorry and people don't. And that's human nature. You're like, it's not my fault. I didn't do that to you. I'm here to solve your problem, right? But the simple act of saying, wow, that sucks. Like, I'm really sorry that that happened. And being genuine about it can be so powerful for folks that they're almost caught off guard. A lot of our customers are like, whoa, like, thank you thanks for being sorry, right? And it just, it puts you on a different level to begin rebuilding that relationship, um, which I think is really important. And so once you have um, empathized with that person and you've given your genuine apology, um, it's time to go to lesson number four, which again, we come full circle uh, with deliver wow. Um, so delivering wow is about being empowered and taking ownership of each relationship to do whatever it takes to leave that person with a positive impression of the work that you're doing, right? And uh, with their relationship with Zappos. And a great example is that our call uh, center representatives are empowered to give any value of coupon that they want to give, right? Um, you know, that they deem is necessary to make up for whatever loss of service somebody's had. Yes, I see some looks. Try it, call, and see what happens, right? I'm not saying abuse the system, but if something has happened, call in and see what happens. But they're empowered to give any value, right? $50, $100, whatever they feel is right 
to rectify the situation with that person, right? Um, we are allowed to um, permit the return of shoes that somebody has worn for an entire year, even though that's against policy to return worn shoes, if we feel like it's the right thing to do for the customer, right? And and I think what's even more interesting about that is that we don't have to check with managers or let me get my supervisor on the phone or let me call somebody else and put you on hold so you can be irritated and pretend like you talked to somebody, right? That's not the drill. I just actually on the phones had the power to say, I'm so sorry that happened. Would a um, hundred dollar gift certificate make up for that? Can I offer you a hundred dollar gift certificate? Right? And I had the power to do that. Um, and I mean, Zappos really puts its money where its mouth is. And I think there's a story that sort of highlights this. We had a seasonal call worker who came in. So during uh, the holiday season, we get a ton of calls. So we hire these seasonal uh, workers. And they get the same training as everybody else. We say, you're empowered to wow. Like, do whatever it takes. Um, you know, give them a coupon or let them return shoes. And so this call uh, center representative was on the phone and got, you know, an escalated call, a call that was really challenging for him. And um, he gave the person a thousand dollar coupon, a thousand, just a grand, like a cool grand, right? Like, will this buy you off? Will you stop being angry with me for giving you a thousand dollars? And, you know, he just did that. He didn't ask anybody. He was like, uh, here's a thousand dollars. I'm so sorry. Um, and then after the call, he sort of like, you know, puts his phone down, walks to his lead, and is like, hey, um, I just want you to know that I gave $1,000 uh, to a customer just a minute ago. And the lead is like, that's what, wow, yeah, wow, that's a great response, right? He wowed the pants off of that lead that day, so great for him. Um, you know, and the lead just had to kind of smile and say, like, awesome. I'm so glad that you, like, knew what I meant when I said you're empowered and, like, you really took it there. And, like, maybe let's talk about some other ways to wow other than giving away thousands of dollars, right? Let's investigate some other solutions to that. Um, but I think it's a testament to the fact that, like, we mean what we say, right? And that each person on the phones should take complete ownership over that relationship and make that relationship their own, right? Without having to pass it on to somebody else or pass that relationship on. Um, and so I think that's really powerful um, uh, sort of story and kind of sums up what I learned when I was uh, working in customer service at Zappos.com. And um, one thing I want to add is that these strategies seem a little bit far-fetched and they seem um, a little bit out there, um, but they're actually incredibly powerful for our company. Not only do we have what I would argue is one of the happiest call center staffs in the world. We have best in class turnover, like our call center employees stay for a really long time. Um, but it's good for the bottom line of our business too, right? We take the money that we would have invested in marketing and we invest it in customer service and word of mouth becomes our most powerful marketing tool. Right? And what's even crazier than that is that a very small percentage of our customers actually call in. Most customers of Zappos.com, hopefully some of you here are among that group of customers, um, most of them will never call into the center. They'll just do their transactions online and they'll get it done and they'll be finished with it, right? But the small percentage of people who call in and build that relationship are so on fire and so incredibly connected to Zappos that they become a really powerful tool of word of mouth marketing for us, which is pretty incredible. Um, so that's the Zappos story, and I want to, if you guys will humor me, sort of pivot and talk about how some of these lessons might apply to our work um, here at Teach for America. Um, and I want to start just with my perspective as an alum of Teach for America. And so I would consider myself a really strong alum, okay? I like to fancy myself a strong alum, all right? I um, defend Teach for America whenever I'm called upon to do so, which happens a lot because I'm on the State Board of Education, right? I get ample opportunities to do that, which is great. Um, I share my core story with anybody who will listen. I encourage people to join Teach for America. I diligently fill out my alumni survey every year. Thank you very much, okay? With only one call from an alumni member, I will fill it out. That's sorry, just caveat there. Um, 
but I fill it out. And when I filled out my alumni survey, you know, five years ago, I clicked the button and I said, I would be interested in running for office in three to five years. And then in three to five years, I ran for office, right? Like I feel like I'm a pretty solid alum, right? I'm out there doing the work and I'm excited about it. Um, but what I'll tell you is that it's probably very much due to the fact that I have an incredibly strong personal and emotional connection with Teach for America. And that means I'm married to an executive director, right? I just can't say no. Not that I'm not excited to be here, I'm excited. Um, but, you know, I get a front row seat to the blood, sweat, and tears of the regional team trying to do this work, right? And that is, it's awe-inspiring and it's investing and it's, you know, it just, it motivates me to be a part of this work. And I think the challenge that you guys face is not everybody has a personal and emotional connection to Teach for America. I mean, most of my friends from the core are just out there as individuals doing great things in education, being incredibly powerful, but they don't have any explicit sort of connection to Teach for America, and they don't have that strong emotional connection reminding them day after day about the hard work that it takes to make this stuff come true. And so it is on our shoulders, and I say our because as an alum, I think it's part of my job too, right? It's incumbent upon us to figure out how we can build that connection with the 37,000 alums that we have, right? It is no small task, and I do not envy you guys at all uh, for that work. And um, I hope that we can investigate some of these strategies and how they might apply to your work and hopefully make that job a little easier for you guys in the long run. Um, so I wanna first talk about the listen, 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 okay? And I'm gonna kind of like group number one and number two together here because I think the important thing to know about these is that you can't build a culture on efficiency. Right, you can't build culture on efficiency. And, and I know that you guys do not have 10 hours to sit around chit-chatting with every alum in your region, you know, just so you can get them to show up at the mixer, right? Like that's not a good investment of your time, right? To spend that 10 hours with that person. Um, but I think it says something about really building flexibility into your schedule and uh, making sure that you give the time to alum so that when you're with them, it signals to them like building this relationship with you is incredibly important to me. So important that I'm not going to multitask or I'm not gonna kick you out at the end of this 30 minutes and pull somebody else in, right? And I, I realize that's a tall order, but how can we make alums feel valuable in that way um, and really give them the time to listen to them? And I think one other important point about PEC, I mentioned that you get graded on PEC by picking up background clues. Um, I think there's something important about picking up background clues of our alums, right? Our alums are not just educators, they are musicians and activists and mothers and fathers and family members. And I think when you can pick up on the background clues of their life and bring that to the forefront of that conversation, that can be really powerful, right? Recognizing an alum for their whole person and who they are rather than just the transactional nature of what we do, right? Like we gave you an opportunity, you give us some of your time back, right? That can be incredibly transactional. And so really picking up on those clues and building personal and emotional connection and I realize that not, you guys aren't gonna be able to do that for 37,000 people, right? I think one of the questions then becomes, how can you create opportunities for alums to build personal and emotional connections with each other, right? How can you leverage them and get them together in groups that might be about animal advocacy or whatever other thing that people are interested in and get them to build those emotional connections with each other that will inspire them to continue to be involved in this work? Um, so I want to move to apologize and empathize because I think this is a really important point. I know that I, on a few occasions, have felt like the Teach for America police. And I want to take a quick head nod poll out there. How many of you have ever felt like you had to protect and defend Teach for America against, let's just call them haters, right? Like haters, right? Yeah, so I see some nods, right? Um, I, I mean, this is a hard one, right? Because some alums will come to you having had experiences that you didn't have any control over, right? Like they had a negative experience with their MTLD or somebody else in their region that has really tainted their perception of Teach for America and their ability to engage with you. And you didn't do that, 
right? You didn't commit that against them. You weren't even there. You didn't even know about it, right? But you are the front lines for our alums, right? You absorb their experiences on the front lines of that. And so I would encourage you to think about the small act of saying, I'm sorry. Not, you know, on behalf of yourself, but just on behalf of the experience they had, right? Like, I'm sorry. And like, letting that come from a genuine place. And I think um, that small act can be super radical um, if you employ it in the right way um, by being really genuine and apologizing for them. Um, and I think it can be really powerful for somebody to hear that from a representative of the organization. Um, and so once you've empathized and apologized with people, how can you turn it around and deliver wow? Um, and I want to sort of preface this by saying, I know that you guys don't have a lot of time to like be throwing parties for people and, you know, wowing people with coupons and like free things and whatever, right? Um, but I think there are some small things that you can do that will make alums step back and say, wow, like that was really, that was really cool. Um, one idea is, you know, a new alum moves into your region, right, and you send them a welcome email, like, hey, welcome to Las Vegas. I'm so glad you're here. Now, if I'm an alum and I just move someplace, I'm like, how did they even know? Like, that's crazy. Wow, right? Like, that's really neat. That's a wow moment, right? Um, having a conversation and passing with somebody at an event, and they're like, oh, I just adopted a dog, right? Um, you can tell the dog thing is top of mind because I just adopted a dog, but like, yes. Yeah. So let's just say somebody adopted a dog, and you're like, cool. I've got a friend that works at the ASPCA, you know, if you're really interested in animal rights, you guys should talk. And then after that meeting, doing a quick follow-up email, like, hey, this is my friend, right? That's a wow moment. Like, I can't believe you remembered that. That's such a small thing for me to mention to you and for you to follow up. Um, so considering how can you actually make your alum step back and say, wow, like that was really, really cool. Um, and I want to like close this by just admitting that none of these are short-term ROI strategies, right? Like you don't invest in a relationship and like the next day you have 100% attendance at your mixer, right? Like that's just not how it works. Um, but the idea is that it's a long-term investment, right? A long-term investment that hopefully begins to take shape the way that it's taken shape at Zappos, where when you invest in these relationships, these people become your most powerful marketing tool. And that's where I wanna end is, I wonder if we could imagine what it might look like if our alums were Teach for America's most powerful marketing tool. Right, like not our marketing office, not the press releases that we put out, not our incredible, passionate, dynamic leaders, but actually our alums speaking up, being in the comment section of, of you know, all of these articles, uh, giving quotes to newspapers, encouraging their friends and family to join this work, right? I think that would be pretty incredible and it would also make your jobs a lot easier, <laughs> a lot, a lot easier. So um, I think both for our movement, for our kids, and for the work that we do, and also just to save you guys a couple hours of sleep, I think these are all strategies that are worth investigating. And so um, I want to thank you guys and open it up for questions now. Um, so I've been in a couple roles at Zappos. I started off in college recruiting, like I mentioned. Um, now I work on something called the Holacracy Project, um, which is a reorg of our management structures. So we're moving away from like a rigid management hierarchy to more self-organizing pods um, that can kind of create and determine their own sort of work. Um, so I'm really in like change management is what I would say I do now. Um, and I think the lessons about customer service are um, really, really well applied to my internal relationships with other folks at Zappos. And so now I think about, since I'm not, I do deal externally with like media and people like that who have an interest in what we're doing, but I think more importantly, um, I still have to wow my colleagues. Like my colleagues at Zappos are my customers, right, in effect, and I have got to figure out ways to wow them. And so every year when we do our culture um, reviews, um, I have to think about how am I actually 
really implementing WOW with the people that I work with. So I think that's probably one of the strongest, at least everyday reminders that I get about that core value and how to apply it. I don't know. I feel like you guys would know better than me. Um, oh man. Um, I don't know. I mean, I guess, I mean, there's always room to grow in everything, right? It's hard for me to quantify like which one we're doing a bad job. I think, I think I've always felt really inspired and I think we do a great job of reminding people and grounding people in our mission. I think that's something that like we do really well. Um, I think delivering like joy and wow is something that like, as a staff member, I really struggled with. And then as an alum, I have often thought about, like, what would it look like? I've encouraged my husband, what would it look like if all of our first year teachers went to their school sites and like washed all the cars in the parking lot, right? On day one of like the different teachers there. I mean, that might seem crazy or like deliver donuts or like just little things to deliver, like to sort of inject our days and our work with joy and wow. Um, and so I think that's something that, a question that um, we could definitely stand to think about. So what comes to mind is um, usually with every group of like disgruntled core members, right? Um, there's like one, maybe one person in that group that's reachable. Maybe one person who still stays like slightly engaged or is willing to show up even though, even if it's just to like tell you how bad you are at something, there's like somebody who's willing to, yeah, I see some nods out there, right? There's one person who's willing to show up just to let you know that you like didn't think about them, right? Um, and I think if you, I mean, I don't know what the answer to this is, honestly, but I think that if you can find who that one person is, right? I think the lesson here is that a very small percentage of our customers call in. Most of our customers will never have that experience with us. Um, but if we can light those people on fire with what great customer service looks like, they're talking about it, they're blogging about it, they're letting other people know. Um, so it might just be identifying that one person that's an influencer for the rest of that group and really wowing the pants off of them. Easier said than done, I'm sure. Yes. <laughs> Um, so, I think this is pretty top of mind because it's my work right now, but we, I mentioned that we're moving to a system that's more self-organized, which I really think is an incredible leap of faith for our company, an embodiment of what it looks like to empower people. So it used to be that um, a manager is the only person that can like add roles or subtract roles or add projects or subtract projects from a team, right? They kind of control the workflow. Um, but what we've done is we've now given, distributed that authority to every single person in the company. So every person can come to a meeting and say, hey, I wanna propose a new role on our team, right? Like I sense attention that like we need somebody to cover this and I'm gonna propose that. And I don't have to ask for permission or or I don't have to get somebody's blessing on that. I don't have to CC a million people to make sure nobody gets butt hurt about the decisions that I've just made, right? Like I am empowered to show up at that meeting and um, add that piece of structure to our team. And I think that is a really powerful piece of authority that um, shows people that we trust them.